right, tonight we are honored to have Karis Rittenauer with us. Um, Karis joined Manumet's Shorebird Habitat Management Division in 2020 as a conservation biologist focused on increasing the pace and scale of shorebird friendly habitat management in Louisiana. To help protect shorebird species, the Habitat Management Division works to develop and assist a network of partners to improve habitat and promote a culture of shorebird conservation. Karis's work in Louisiana is conducted in partnership with regional partners, including, but not limited to, the National, Conservation, National Resources Conservation Service, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, to deliver shorebird habit, habitat on working wetlands and public lands. Karis has worked for over seven years as a field biologist across the United States with an emphasis in avian ecology, wetland protection, and restoration. She holds an MS in Renewable Natural Resources with Wildlife Concentration from LSU, where she studied the next nesting success of colonial nesting water birds on a coastal island slated for restoration. And she has a BS in Ecology, Evolution, and Behavioral Biology from Deloitte? Deloitte College. Uh, when not working or birding, Karis can be found spending time with her own animals, several fish, a snake, a horse, and two dogs. So welcome, Karis. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really excited to talk to y'all about shorebirds and their conservation here in Louisiana, as well as uh, throughout the Western Hemisphere. Um, as Jane mentioned, I'm a conservation biologist with Manomet, which is a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to preserving shorebirds and their habitat. And here in Louisiana, I work closely with Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, shorebirds and their habitats. Uh, we are focusing today on uh, non-shore shorebirds, so the ones that you wouldn't ne necessarily expect to see on a beach or a, uh, a coastal marsh, but instead uh, those that use a little bit different habitats inland. Um, we'll talk about Manomet's work throughout the mid-continent. Um, my particular work with the NRCS uh, Shorebirds of Louisiana Wetlands Initiative and what conservation practices that entails, as well as uh, monitoring and birding opportunities. So I'm sure many of you are avid birders and already know uh, the definition of a shorebird, but I have run into a fair few people who don't. So when I talk about shorebirds, I'm not talking about uh, other waders such as ibis, um, herons and egrets, or uh, spoonbills. I'm talking about relatively small for their relatively small bodied birds, such as plovers, sandpipers, and etc. When I talk about what their habitat needs are, um, they need open habitat, so a lack of tree cover, minimal vegetation, and shallow flooding somewhere between a saturated mud flat to about six inches uh, of standing water, depending on the leg length of the species you're talking about. Uh, they also prefer little disturbance and abundant invertebrates, which they uh, probe out of the mud in those uh, shallow water areas. So here in Louisiana, um, we have a few a sh few species that breed. Um, along the Gulf Coast, we have snowy plovers, Wilson's plovers, and American oyster catchers. And within the Mississippi alluvial valley, we have killdeer, blackneck stilts, willets, and spotted sandpipers. Um, but for the most part, when we talk about shorebirds in Louisiana, the vast majority of them are going to be migrating through either on their fall or spring migration, um, or sometimes both. So in talking about migration for shorebirds, it can be a little bit different than you might expect for say waterfowl or some other species. They start their spring migration very early in February and almost all of the species are um, up north in their breeding habitats by the end of May. Um, they uh, start coming back down as early as July with the peak of 
shorebird migration in Louisiana being around uh, August, September. So it's actually a great time to go out and look at shorebirds right now. Um, but some species migrate all the way into November here. And then we do have a few species who stay here for the winter, uh, staying from November to February. So uh, talking about the kinds of habitats that these birds use outside of uh, the shore and shoreline habitats, uh, a huge one that's really important is managed impoundments. So what I mean by that is if you've ever been to Sherburn WMA, um, they have uh, managed impoundments or more moist soil uh, impoundments that um, have levees around the outside and some kind of water control structure that lets them uh, control the uh, level of the water throughout the year. Um, so Sherburn is a great example and a great place to go birding if you're interested in seeing shorebirds, especially this time of year as they actively manage for shorebirds uh, by creating that mudflat to shallow water habitat uh, right now in uh, late August, early September, ahead of flooding up for duck season. Um, and so some of the species you might be able to see there are least sandpipers, stilt sandpipers, and pectorals. Uh, they also use agricultural lands, uh, not just in the Cajun Prairie, but also throughout the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. Um, especially, they're especially fond of uh, crawfish and rice fields because uh, it's similar to a, an impoundment. They have levees on all sides and some control over the water level. Um, and so especially in spring, you'll see a lot of species like the semi palmated sandpiper and the lesser yellow legs using uh, early rice fields that have just been seeded or are just starting to germinate. Uh, that's a really prime habitat for them, especially in the spring. And then there are shorebird species that use grasslands, uh, including the buff-breasted sandpiper and American golden plover, uh, in addition to the upland sandpiper. And so these are often found in prairie remnants, as well as uh, managed grasslands and, as you can see here, uh, cattle, uh, cattle lands. So on the right here, you can see um, some shorebirds using that early rice habitat that I was talking about. And this is generally how uh, you'll find shorebirds here in Louisiana in big mixed species flocks all feeding together. Um, and they can be a little bit tricky to tell apart. Um, but just within this presentation, I'm going to be focusing a little bit on uh, two species, especially um, the wimbrel on the top left there and the buff-breasted sandpiper. And both of these are uh, species of high conservation concern according to the U.S. Shoreward Plan in 2016. Um, I also want to highlight that all, almost all shorebird species are in decline. Um, there is, especially those that migrate long distances, there was a paper put out not too long ago studying 19 long distance migrating shorebird species, uh, showing that there was an overall decline of 50% just in the last 40 years. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about long distance migrating shorebirds? Um, here's another species that is sometimes referred to as a long distance migrant, especially uh, within waterfowl, the snow goose. Um, you might have seen them wintering here in Louisiana. Um, and so on the map, you can see uh, they breed in about the same place. The uh, orange dot is representing the goose and the green uh, star is representing the buff-breasted sandpiper. They both breed in the high Arctic. Alaska and Canada. Um, and the snow goose migrates down here for the winter into the southern United States, while the buff-breasted sandpiper goes almost twice as far all the way to southern South America. And just to put this in perspective, um, they're about 2% of the goose's body weight. Um, they weigh about the same, buff-breasted sandpipers weigh approximately the same as two AA batteries, and they can't uh, soar. So they are flapping the entire way on that journey. Um, they're really, really impressive migrant species. And uh, this is about an 18,000 mile trip every year for them, uh, 9,000 miles each way. So um, they're really, really impressive little, little birds. So I'll talk a little bit about Manomet's shorebird work. We uh, 
have research and we um, base all of our conservation and shorebird work in science. Um, based on these scientific studies, we help identify sites that are in need of conservation for shorebirds. As you can see in that second picture, those are all Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network uh, areas. Um, and that's a group that works uh, through and with Manomet to uh, find and protect areas that shorebirds need to, to thrive. Um, and we also work on the ground with individuals, communities, um, producers and landowners, as well as organizations and uh, um, entities like LDWF to promote habitat management for shorebirds on the ground. So uh, Louisiana is a part of what we call the third flyway. It's the mid-continent flyway, as you can see here. To the east, we've got the Atlantic flyway. To the west, we've got the Pacific. Those get a lot more of the attention, especially if you're talking about shorebirds, as they have a lot more of the shore. Um, largely, a lot of the birds that migrate through the center of the continent sometimes tend to get overlooked, um, but they're just as cool and just as important. Um, but a small uh, piece of that is that the Atlantic Flyway and Pacific Flyway, the Atlantic Flyway has had a shorebird plan since 2015. The Pacific Flyway has had one since 2017. And we are just now in the final uh, development of the Mid-Continent Shorebird Conservation Initiative, uh, which has been a really great grassroots effort to be a part of um, and entails uh, getting folks together from the entire uh, region in South America, Central America, and North America and the Arctic. So Louisiana itself is crucial for shorebirds. We have almost 40 shorebird species come through annually, and those include the uh, ones that I mentioned that breed here and a few species that will uh, winter here. We're a key stopover site for more than a million shorebirds, and that's only increasing as uh, climate change increases the number of number and length of droughts, especially in nearby states and other interior states. So birds that may have uh, once been able to stop in Oklahoma at a um, at an ephemeral wetland are finding those wetlands more and more often dry and they and Louisiana stays um, much more reliably wet uh, than many of those other states. Um, it's also the first stop in North America on their spring migration and their last chance to refuel before crossing the open Gulf of Mexico on their southbound migration. Uh, so some of the work that Manomet does in the mid-continent, here's that buff-breasted sandpiper again. Again, they breed up in the uh, high Arctic, uh, Alaska and Canada, and we have researchers um, such as uh, Shiloh Schulte, this, this guy in uh, whose hands you can see in this picture, um, who go up there every year and uh, conduct surveys, nest studies, and uh, catch birds to GPS and uh, cellular tag them so that we can track not only their movements um, as they migrate, but also uh, get a, a better idea of how they're using the individual um, sites where they're breeding, wintering, and stopping over. So these same um, buff-breasted sandpipers are often the ones that will come straight through Louisiana on their uh, migration. They're uh, often found further west and north. Uh, as I mentioned, these are more upland species. So they're often found in uh, the Red River area and on uh, sod farms, as well as cattle ranches, et cetera, um, here in Louisiana. But we also have folks down in Laguna de Rocha in Uruguay studying these species as well. And they're working with farmers uh, on the ground there to research and apply the best management practices to get the most out of these uh, grasslands for both the beef industry and for the shorebirds. Um, one of our more recent uh, studies has been on the Wimbrel. As you can see, this Wimbrel has a GPS satellite transmitter backpack on. Uh, his name is Sadler Roshit, 
And uh, this is an example of one uh, year of migration. So you can see that red line there is the southbound migration. They don't stop here in Louisiana in the, um, on their way to winter in, in South America. They usually cross the open Atlantic Ocean. And then in the spring on their way up, they will stop here in Louisiana on their way uh, back to the breeding grounds. Um, and so uh, here are uh, some of the points that um, Sadler Rochette used um, in just one spring of being here. Um, and as you can see, they use a lot of farm fields, especially rice fields in that early spring area. Um, and for a long time, we've known, we've seen Wimbrel, and I'm sure some of you have seen Wimbrel out in the agricultural fields feeding during the day, but we didn't know where they were going um, at night to roost. And so just in the last couple of years now with a couple of uh, banded and um, satellite transmitted birds, we've been able to uh, sort of narrow down an area that we think that they roost at. So if you can see all of those clustered um, dots down in the lower right-hand corner near Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge. Um, we have been conducting a series of night roost counts, um, counting the number of wimbrel that come in from the fields um, in several areas along there. And we've been able to uh, not quite pinpoint, but uh, narrow down an area where we think at least 3,000 wimbrel are roosting nightly. Um, so during the day, they go as far inland as 50 miles, um, and they eat their fill on agricultural and uh, other uh, wetland land, and then they will all come and uh, have safety in numbers as they roost on in the coast, um, the coastal marsh there. So that's been a really cool thing to be a part of just um, finding that out in the last couple of years. And we're uh, looking forward to making moves towards um, protecting that area and hopefully creating a Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network site uh, where they're roosting, as that is a significant number of the uh, amount of the population of Wimbrel. So as I mentioned, um, this is their uh, breeding or their, their uh, migration schedule again. Um, and Louisiana has an abundant amount of habitat in the spring with those rice fields and everything. Um, and for the fall migration, it's a little bit trickier. Um, in July, August, and early September, a lot of those rice fields that were such great habitat in the spring will be, you know, three feet and in, in deep, uh, dense rice uh, that make those fields impossible for the shorebirds to use. Um, and then uh, crawfish fields, like the one you see on the left hand here, um, are often dried by this point and do not offer very good habitat. Um, so here's, as you can see, a, a rice field in the spring just covered with shorebirds. So that's where uh, my work comes in with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. Um, NRCS is a division of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they work with farmers across the United States to conserve soil and water and uh, create and follow best practices on their lands. Um, they also provide on-farm habitat to wildlife. So this is the Working Lands for Wildlife program map of all of the different um, regions that have specific wildlife that they are protecting on farms. Uh, and most of these are endangered or declining species. Um, so here in Louisiana, we have a state priority of uh, shorebirds on farms. This is the map of uh, parishes in which you can enroll in this program. And we're the only state in the country to have a shorebird focused program, which is pretty cool. Um, and we um, chose that region to be the most uh, important just because uh, that's where farmland has increased the most uh, in the last several years. And even though uh, increasing farmland can be a detriment and can uh, harm 
um, natural habitat for these species. For shorebirds in particular, it can actually um, be a huge opportunity um, for, shore, for shorebirds because of the type of crops that we have here in Louisiana and the way that they use water. Um, so there are several eligible practices um, that we are incentivizing farmers to perform on their lands. Um, they can be creative and have sign up for multiple um, and uh, these contracts will last between one to three years. So first I'll talk about the, uh, it's more focused on rice, but any field that has levees can hold water. Uh, any, uh, as I like to say, any anywhere that can hold water can hold shorebirds. Um, so uh, many of these rice farmers will already be flooding up their land uh, in November to attract uh, waterfowl for hunting. And what we, uh, ask them to do is just to move that up a little bit. Um, they don't have to pump any water on their land, but they um, close the water control structures and col passively collect rainwater starting uh, in early September to mid-September. Um, and then that provides some of that nice uh, shallow water and mudflat habitat for shorebirds as they're coming through on their southbound migration. The other way, uh, the other main practice that we're focused on for shorebird conservation is focused primarily on crawfish fields and fallow fields. Um, this is, uh, in general, crawfish fields, uh, crawfish are harvested from March through May, and usually fields are drawn down. Um, that is, the water is drained out of them uh, at the beginning of May through June. And uh, as we saw in that migration wheel, uh, that's when most of these shorebirds are up north and can't benefit from that nice mudflat habitat that happens when uh, crawfish fields are drawn down. And so we're asking and incentivizing farmers to hold water on their fields until the end of July or the end of August uh, to be able to, and we're not actually after the habitat that's created while they're you know, three feet deep. Um, but that brief habitat moment when um, they've been drawn down and it's uh, shallow water to mudflat habitat is really important for shorebirds. And some of these species will only stay in Louisiana for about 10 days. Um, and so even though this habitat is very short lived, it can be an absolutely huge gain for shorebirds, especially because there are a ton of invertebrates within that uh, mud mud under those crawfish fields that haven't been uh, eaten by any other birds for a whole year. And so um, it is really a smorgasbord when, um, when they do draw it down. And by having an option for either July 31st or August 31st, we can have different fields um, offering that ha that ephemeral habitat at different times. And so uh, it'll support shorebirds throughout more of their uh, migration. So, so far um, we're very early in this program. Uh, in 2021, we got 20 contracts for over 10,000 acres in total. And uh, we are still in the process of uh, getting those contracts out for 2022. Um, so I can't uh, say exactly how many we have yet, but it is looking like it might be even more, uh, which is very exciting. Um, and so we're just beginning right now to monitor the first of these farms going into these conservation practices. And we're monitoring them both to gauge the shorebird response, but also to engage with farmers and landowners and try and get them interested in the birds that are on their lands and in shorebird conservation, especially so that they will continue these practices even after uh, the funding uh, that they get for them has uh, ended after that three-year period where they're getting funding to provide these, habitat, uh, these habitats. Um, we're also gathering data for the International Shorebird Survey, which I will talk about in just a minute. Um, so this is just from one farm 
that I've been surveying this summer so far, but um, you can really see a difference uh, in this farm started drawing down their crawfish fields on the 1st of August. And you can see in August and early, or in uh, July and very early August, there were um, not too many shorebirds and not very many species. They were mostly black neck stilts. And then as the water started to uh, draw further down, um, we saw more and more species and more and more numbers of, of shorebirds using these fields. Um, and actually, because it's been such a wet summer, the habitat lasted a lot longer than we expected. We only expected, like I mentioned, that 10 to 14 day window. Um, but because it was so wet this year, um, that habitat just kept getting re-moistened re and, uh, and redrained. And so it kept that shallow water mudflat habitat all the way until um, September 1st, when we saw 11 different species and all over 400 uh, individuals. So the International Shorebird Survey um, is one of the things that I am most proud of that Manomet does. Um, it is a citizen science project that has been running since the 70s um, and is where y'all come in if you are interested in joining. Um, you don't have to be a shorebird expert. There are scientists that do it, but uh, it's mostly a citizen science project. And um, it's it's very easy. All you need is access to a site where shorebirds are. It doesn't have to be the best shorebird site in the world. It just has to be someplace where you can see shorebirds in the fall and the spring, usually. Um, access to that same site year round. Um, we ask folks to survey at least three times in the fall and three times in the spring um, as this uh, citizen science project is focused on monitoring migrating shorebirds. Um, but some folks will monitor as much as uh, once a week throughout the whole year if they're uh, very committed to their site. And this is one thing that's different about um, ISS vers versus something like the Audubon Coastal Bird Surveys in that um, every individual gets to pick their own site. And so it, you can really feel some ownership over it. It's, it's your site, they're your birds. And you can really see over a period of time how um, the bird use changes. And that's, that's really cool. Um, so it's very easy to do surveys. You just use the eBird app. And then at the end, there's a little drop down menu and you select ISS. Um, I'm happy to uh, talk to anyone who is interested in uh, potentially setting up an ISS site afterwards. Um, I'll have my contact information on the last slide. And uh, if you're interested, I'd love to talk to you about it. All of this, all of the data that we collect from this is uh, online uh, free for all to use and has been used in a lot of really important projects, including the 3 Million Birds Project, as well as several um, grad student uh, and other papers. Um, so speaking of those shorebird sites, um, here are a few of the best places to go if you wanna see shorebirds in Louisiana, and this will include coastal shorebirds as well uh, so that we didn't talk about too much today. So Rockefeller Sabine area in the Southwest Louisiana, um, the Mississippi River, Birdfoot Delta, uh, so places like Grand Isle um, and Elmer's Island, uh, the Atchafalaya River Delta. So Sherburn is one of the best places in that region to see shorebirds, as I mentioned. Um, the Cajun Prairie, uh, depending on uh, the right time of year, you can go out and look at just about any field. Uh, <laughs> In that, in that area around Crowley, and uh, you'll see some shorebirds. And then Catahoula Lake, if you want to go a little bit farther north, is another really important uh, place for shorebirds to be found. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Again, here is my contact information. You can uh, feel free to call, text, or email me, especially if you're interested in doing ISS. But even if you just have you know, burning questions about shorebirds, I'm always happy to talk about them. So. Um, feel free to reach out. But I can answer a few questions here now as well.
All right, does anybody have questions for Karis? Don't see any in the chat. I'll ask one. Huh? Uh, this is Lawrence. Um, I'm just kind of curious how you came up with the dollar amounts to pay the um, rice producers to participate in this um, you know, project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that uh, it's an incentive, but it's it's mostly a cost share. So what they do is they um, uh, determine about how much they think it will it will um, cost rice or crawfish producers to do the practice, and then uh, the NRCS will pay seventy five percent of that, um, and so. Uh, it's an incentive, but it's it's usually it's calculated to not be more than the actual practice will cost uh, the producers to implement. And how did you approach the producers to engage them to become involved? Yeah, well, a lot of that work um, is done by NRCS field office uh, field agents. Um, they often have longstanding uh relationships with some of these farmers. Um, and so there are some low hanging fruit that are our farmers that um, have been enrolled in other NRCS practices, know the NRCS guys and um, were very interested uh, within these first couple of years. And then um, as we're starting to sort of branch out into finding more folks that aren't as clued in with uh, NRCS, we're, uh, doing outreach with the uh, both LSU and uh, we're hoping to do some outreach with the Southern University uh, Ag Center, as well as uh, looking for local farming groups um, to give talks at and uh, and just inform about about these new programs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Karis, I know that Audubon does, um, Audubon Delta does um, shorebird surveys as well. I think they they actually ramped up here a couple of weeks ago. So how does that dovetail with, um, with Manomet's work? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Uh, this is something that Manomet and Audubon Delta have been working closely on. Um, so they do uh, primarily the Audubon coastal bird surveys. Um, and so there are a specific number of sites along uh, the coast of Louisiana, um, and they focus a little bit more on uh, wintering shorebirds as opposed to migrating shorebirds, which is ISS, uh, the focus of ISS. Um, and so we're actually working together to uh, try to uh, increase our volunteers um, that may be able to do either both ACBS and ISS or um, maybe more interested in one than the other. But uh, the way that you do the survey is almost exactly the same. And uh, we are right now in conversation with Audubon about how to uh, include, incorporate that data that they're gathering in with our data uh, from ISS from throughout the Western hemisphere. And so hopefully soon the, they'll join our uh, huge uh, amount of data from the last 40 years throughout um, throughout the Western Hemisphere, and we'll be able to work together a little bit more closely on that. Great. And I see a question. Um, Terry asked for more information about ISS and how um, one can find out about how to participate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can well, as I said, you're welcome to uh, take my con my contact information, and we can uh, talk more about that um, outside of uh, this talk if you're interested. Um, as well as you can uh, look uh, Google uh, Manomet International Shorebird Survey um, to find the information online, um, and. Um, yeah, it's it's a really it's a really easy way to get into uh, the citizen science. All you have to do is is find a spot and um, start surveying in the spring and fall, um, 
it, as I said, it, it's all through eBird. So just as you would normally, you can even put in other species. It doesn't have to be just shorebirds. You can put in your whole list if you want, um, and then uh, just tag it at the end as uh, ISS and we'll be able to use that data. Um, and so it's obviously best to be in contact with someone at MetaMet to make sure that we uh, know that you're doing it and uh, are all set with how how it's working. But um, uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty easy and it's really rewarding. I have a couple of sites myself uh, that I'm going to. So do you does MetaMet then help um, coordinate access to private property to do ISS surveys, or do, do people just need to find their own? Spots? Um, we can, yeah, we can absolutely help uh, with, with facilitating access to private properties. There's also a number of, um, uh, places like, uh, we don't have anybody currently surveying Sherburn, uh, which would be a great place to have an ISS site, um, as well as, uh, sometimes there can be just, uh, sites that are along roadsides. I have one site that is on private property and I have uh, one site that is um, on private property, but I just survey from the road. Uh, and so I don't have to worry about getting access. Okay. Um, other questions? Anybody in the room have questions? Um, I can see in the chat, there's a question about the stilts on this slide. Uh, can you age them or are they in breeding plumage? These stilts are in breeding plumage. You can tell um, from the uh, uh, rufus on their uh, uh, eye and their crown. Um, and I believe that middle one may be a juvenile um, as it's not as bright, but um, it's hard to tell from this picture. All right, um, Kathy, I just asked the question about coordination with Audubon Coastal Bird Surveys. Um, she said that they they are definitely in talk in discussion with Audubon Delta and coordinating that Audubon Delta uh, focus on mostly on winter um, shorebirds and. Um, ISS is mainly in migration, but they're definitely working together there. And then um, Terry asked, is it okay to do this on public property? Uh, where in Sherbet is a good spot? And do you mean South Farm or off Whiskey Bay? So there's definitely South Farm because that's where the impoundments are. I know the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah, um, South Farm is where they do a lot of the management for shorebirds. Oh, um, okay. 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 Yeah. Um, and yeah, okay. it's, it's totally okay to do it on public property. Uh, if you, um, need help facilitating entry to a place I can, you can contact me and I can work on, um, helping with that. But, uh, yeah, anywhere you can, anywhere you can go and see birds, you can, um, do ISS. Okay. Okay. All right, any other questions? You got it. Thank you from Katie and some other people. And we do very much appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. I've uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to present to y'all and um, really, really do reach out to me. Um, I love talking about shorebirds and I'll uh, answer anything I can. So thank you so much. I think they're they're a tricky group for a lot of people, especially <laughs> new birders. And so, the more we can learn about them and um, and their amazing uh, habits, like the long distance migration, the, the more we can appreciate them. So, yeah, absolutely. And I'd love to come back sometime and and do some shorebird ID work with y'all if you're interested, because uh, I know that can be a little intense. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop our recording here.